Hi, everyone, and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Welcome to the second, I think it is, uh, uh, live stream of the new year. We've got a fantastic subject today uh, and a fantastic guest. Uh, he's one of my favourite people out here in the wider sort of fandom community, somebody I'm sure many of you already know, but I will let him introduce himself. JR, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody out there in In Deep Geek Land. Uh, I'm JR from Geek Chat One. That's been a uh, missing as of recently, but uh, thank you, Robert, for inviting me on as always and uh, making me pull back and unveil the covers. Oh, goodness me. Uh, we're starting there, are we? Uh, I guess so we're <laughs> pulling back and unveiling the covers. Uh, so, uh, do you want, for those who do not know, what actually is Geek Chat One? Uh, Geek Chat One is a group that started uh, bringing content creators together with their communities and with fans from all over the place, uh, across all the fandoms. And it was a place for us to talk about all the things that make us happy, all the geek, geeky stuff out there that uh, in the last decade certainly has come to a head with, between comic books and Marvel and, and Marvel movies, DC on different stuff. It was a place to come and talk about all of that, including the good old stuff like Tolkien and some George R. R. Martin thrown in for good measure. Uh, we just had fun talking about everything that we loved. Excellent. And I would highly recommend uh, I'm uh, an active-ish member of Geek Chat One over on Facebook. So I would highly recommend, I'm sure, actually, Chrissy has already put my, uh, one of my moderators has already put a link there in the uh, chat. If you Chrissy are of Old Stones, live. dropping links like always. Uh, absolutely. Um, Hi, Chrissy. So I love you. We need to talk soon. Are you still coming to Vegas? That's a sidebar conversation. A side, sidebar conversation. But so uh, what I said last week was that this has been a fantastic time of year for uh, fans of genre fiction, of, of fantasy, of sci-fi. We've had so many excellent things coming out over the last few weeks. Uh, there was The Mandalorian. There was His Dark Materials. There's Dracula that I'd love to talk about at some point. Um, Doctor Who, which we should get Helen on to talk about restarted. that. started. Um, uh, but the the big thing which uh, I think occupied a huge amount of people's attention was The Witcher. And so that's what we're going to be talking about now, not just The Witcher. Uh, what I want to do is sort of comparisons across with Game of Thrones as well. We'll get into Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire a bit more a bit later. But I just wanted to throw it over to you, JR. I know you've uh, you, you've watched The Witcher. What what Did you like it? What, what did you think? Uh, I, I liked a lot of it. Um, there are parts that I would have liked. I, I understand some of the changes that they made from the books. I mean, I get, you have to adapt. That's what this is. It's an adaptation, right? Um, there's some ones that I was just really, really tied to that I wanted to see come out that that didn't quite come out the way that I envisioned. And, you know, some. I mean, I would nitpick it, but it's really nitpicks. I thought it was great for what it was. It's supposed to be exactly what it was. And people seem to not understand that. It's supposed to be like somewhere between campy and, and Game of Thrones. And it kind of falls into line with that. That's what it's supposed to be. The music I will complain about, though, because some of the music is pretty god-awful. <laughs> well, we'll get onto the music at the moment. I've had a question from one of my patrons about the music. Uh, as always, I'll structure a lot of this around the questions I get from my patrons. Absolutely. Um, uh, but uh, I think that the... Uh, uh, I, I would sort of agree with you that I, I really I enjoyed it. Uh, is 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 the sort of the summary of wh where it is. Um, it's based on the first two books in the kind of the Witcher saga, the, the collections of short stories, um, oh, and it story. is a pretty good adaptation. Well, a it's, it's bit, got some blood of elves in there. It's like sprinkled in there. So you have the last wish stuff is predominantly what you see, and then you get bits and pieces of um, blood of elves kind of mixed in with it. Yeah, so so they made it a little bit more on the elf side of it as well, and what that means, particularly with the Siri storyline, which for me didn't really kick off. It was a, just a matter of getting her from A to B. Um, but the one of the things which came across to me was the fact that the critics broadly didn't like it. They were very divided, but there were some very very bad reviews. But the fans loved it. Why do you think? What do you think that was? Uh, I think part of it's the disconnect of uh, critics with reality. I mean, there's been a lot of critically acclaimed movies that I thought were, were absolute garbage. Uh, you know, I love pretty much love all movies. Like it takes me a lot to hate a movie. 
um, because I can find some redeeming quality in it is, is what I usually go for. Like, oh, well, you know, they did this really well, um, but that was it. Um, but I, I think critics might have a little bit of disconnect, especially with the genre. If they think, and we're getting to an age now where, you know, Tolkien has really started to, to die down again. I know you don't want to hear that, but, you know, it's always the benchmark for high fantasy. And now Game of Thrones is sort of taking that benchmark um, away from Lord of the Rings. Not that I think it'll ever really go away because it's impossible to let that happen. Um, but this one kind of falls in between both of them. And they it's not Tolkien. It's not Game of Thrones. What are we supposed to make of this? Um, there's comedy in here that shouldn't be in here. There's a lot of softly spoken underlying tones to everything. I don't know what's really going on. I think it's hard for them to follow. And it, even knowing the books, there was some timeline jumps that even got me going, okay, wait, wait where are we? Uh, and I have to pause it and rewind it and go back and they go, oh, okay, I'm good now. So I, I think it is confusing on first watch if you don't sit back and watch it again and go, oh, this is what's going on the whole time. Okay. Yeah, and... Uh... For those who haven't watched it, I did do a video uh, setting out as an overview of the season, setting out the timeline. So if you are confused about it and want to watch a video, go and check elsewhere on my channel. Um, the, the I want to pick up on the, the Tolkien thing. You know I love Tolkien. Uh, I, I want to pick you. up on the, 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 the Tolkien thing there. Um, my take on this is that um, I think George R. R. Martin has said this, is that everything that is writ been written in sort of Western fantasy world in the last more than half a century, heading towards a century now, has been either uh, sort of conforming to Tolkien or trying to break away from Tolkien. And, and look, uh, sort of Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire, is, is an attempt to kind of bring it away. For me, The Witcher is actually very much firmly in that kind of Tolkien camp. We get this, the, the, the elves in the forest, the mystical, uh, magical elves. We get the dwarves in the mines who are great at sort of fixing things and all the rest of it. You get uh, dragons. You get this great high fantasy world of sorcerers and, and in their, their towers and all the rest of it. It's not actually, this isn't a criticism, it's not reinventing the wheel. This is taking uh, a Tolkien, the Tolkien tropes, and sort of reinventing them in this uh, kind of uh, the atmosphere of the U Eastern European folklore is how I would personally. No, it's exactly what it is. I mean, that's where it, Sapowski wrote it from, right? I mean, the, the Witcher, which is in, in The Last Wish, which was kind of shown in the show, and that's the one that I really wish they would have done justice with. It had actually just done the entire story. I would have made one complete great episode from beginning to end, and you wouldn't have, it would have solved a couple of things for them thematically. Um, but that was the one that he won the prize with. I mean, that was the third, third place in a writing contest in Poland. The, the, this is written in Polish. It was, it's native language is Polish. And so anytime it translates, you know, you lose certain amounts of that. Uh, Helen and I had a long discussion about this, like a year, like this time last year about all of it. And she's like, well, the thing about it in Polish is it reads like a, a poetic saga. Like it, it reads like Ragnarok. It reads, uh, you know, along some of those um, poetic uh, hero journeys and hero starts when you read it in Polish. So it does lose some when you translate it into English. Helen's like, I'm good because I read it in the native language. I'm like, okay, well, fine. I didn't. Yeah, just just showing off again about how many language he, languages you can speak, uh, but I th I think that it does show through in the books. Uh, the, the the translation, um, I I don't honestly don't know who did the translation, and I therefore do not know. It's, they certainly did a better job than I could do. Uh, right. But I I I do not know the extent to which there is an extra layer there. I sometimes do wonder whether there's there's a sort of a uh, great translations don't just translate the words, they translate the feel. And it's probably at a pause point where you ask that, where there is something else written in there because you you know it from reading in your own language and like, hey, this is a point where they should be doing this and you understand the tropes and how, how to work a story. And so now it should be right there. If you're pausing to ask that question, like, I wonder what else is in here. That's where it's at. Yeah, exactly. I almost so, guarantee it. So, so I, I think where i would go is that my and and 
I mean, I know you've read the books. So my take on reading the books was when I started them, I honestly, and I think I even tweeted tweeted out something like this when I was like halfway through the first book, it comes across as kind of sub-Conan, uh, just fancy, tropish, kind of like here's a guy going out, uh, getting the damsel and killing the baddie monster and all the rest of it. But the further in you get, there are layers there. There are layers there about uh, not just sort of the things we talk about often about destiny and all the rest of it, but also about outgrouping and uh, and um, xenophobia. And, and uh, there's also, I, I read, it was interpreted at the time in Poland as quite a critique of the free market, because it was sort of when Poland was emerging from communism and moving into the, the sort of the, uh, what's it like having a more yeah, capitalist society? Right in the early well. 90s, the wall had literally just fallen. And exactly. So what is, was what was your take when you read the books? What was your sort of take in terms of how it felt to you? Uh, as far as the, the feel of the story and if it was furthering another idea or cause or anything else. I don't think it really was. I mean, I understand what you're saying completely about the fall of communism and, and the free market world and, and being, you know, it's, it's got to be quite a jump coming straight from communist Russia into the free market and somebody telling you you're free, right? Like how, how does, how does one go about doing that? It was a couple of generations ago that had freedom, but most of the people alive during the, the freedom or the, the, freeing of the polish market of the polish people that they weren't there for that they don't know what it is so how do you tell people they're free now yeah and i think that it's well as i say it's moving across to a geopolitical discussion but yeah, yeah happens. what happened with sort of eastern europe was a a complete change and uh, and i think depending on which country you're in it the, the 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 country adapted in different ways um, and, and the snapping yeah. of control by other subgroups that, that started you had the mafia pretty much ran russia for a decade after the wall fell they were in control of everything because they're the ones that had the money yeah. so i mean it's, yeah. it's the weird factions that end up popping up when you free people and, and this happens no matter where you liberate or what you liberate this will happen no matter what you don't you can't walk in there and tell somebody that they're free when they have no idea what that even means yeah exactly i just want to pick up on a couple of things in the chat that i saw going yeah. through on the way um uh agree we would saying apparently the books are sold out i've heard this too um the, the, the if you go on amazon you'll find that the books are sold out i think that probably says quite a lot about the uh, the huge amount of interest. Um, they are obviously still available if you get them on Kindle and things like that. So uh, mm -hmm. that might be a way around that. Um, uh, Chris Absolutely Volstone, what I was just going to say. Yeah, Chris Volstone is uh, saying, Peter Griffin, talking about Dracula, the, I haven't watched them all yet. I've watched the first episode of Dracula, uh, which I really enjoyed, I have to say. I've got halfway through the second episode. I'm enjoying that one slightly less. Uh, and Chrissy is unfortunately saying that the finale was trash. So I will come back next week and give you my <laughs> my my full review of that. But that's uh, that's where I'm at on that one uh, at the moment. Um, did you watch as as I'm talking about? Did you watch uh, Dracula? I think it's now out on. Netflix. It's on it's on Netflix here. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't even picked it up. But it just I had to get through Mandalorian. Um, I had to go back and rewatch Witcher. So no, I, I haven't picked it up since it's dropped in. Chrissy says it's trash, and so did Helen. So I'm uh, I'm probably out on it. I'll probably watch it eventually. Well, I as I say, I enjoyed the first episode, um, uh, but uh, we'll we'll see. I will have and a I will watch the first inside. episode. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, it, what I would say. My review thus far is that if you've ever watched Sherlock, if you're a fan of Sherlock Holmes uh, and read the books, and you ever watched the Sherlock show by. Um, uh, Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss, uh, they are the same people who wrote Dracula. And it's the same kind of feel, is that they got the ethos and the feel of it right, uh, but changed a lot of details. And so it feels a lot more modern. It's set back in the, at the same time, but it feels a lot more modern in the way that they did it. So that's my sort of general feel of having watched one and a half episodes, but I'll give you a proper review uh, next week. Let's bring this one back to... Um, uh, the Witcher, and uh, let's talk about comparisons to Game of Thrones. Now, this has been 
I would say the sort of the, the lazy critics thing to compare it to Game of Thrones. Uh, what's your take on that? Is it comparable in any way to Game of Thrones? I, uh, it's high fantasy. So good job, guys. You got that right. You could compare them in that. And that's about where it ends for me because it's a completely different story. It's, it's a completely different lore. It's actual real world folklore, very smartly woven into uh, a complete story that I absolutely love for that. Um, I wish more people had read the actual grim version of fairy tales because you get a couple of them in here. Yeah. So I, I think that, I mean, my, my take is yes, that they're, they're different things. Um, the it, you you're, you talk about it being high fantasy. I think that's right. I think that what George R. R. Martin did with uh, the first book in particular was he did high fantasy, pretending it was low fantasy. Um, so uh, he started out in book one. You get the first chapter and the last chapter. You get the introduction of the others and the dragons. But in the middle. All of the people we're told are wise and clever, um, people like Tyrion or or the Maesters or anyone like that, Maester Lewin even, they scoff at magic. They say, this isn't there, you know, what's beyond the wall, Tyrion? Yeah, and he just like snarks and grumkins and all the rest of it. It's like he pretended that this was low fantasy, but then he's built it up. So when we get where we get to where we are in the books or where we ended in the show, it is then high fantasy. And, and we're where, eating it like a, a bowl of pudding. Exactly. And the Witcher has just gone straight in with high fantasy. I mean, it did. Scene, scene one, there's, there's Geralt. He's fighting some, I don't even know what monster it was, but it's got lots of big, horrible sort of arms or mandibles and all the rest of it. And, and he's there with his Witcher powers and all the rest of it. There's no pretending that this is low fantasy. This is high fantasy from the off. Yeah, right from the word go, it's high fantasy. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. They show you immediately that it's high fantasy, um, which I think works for it. It, it. You know, we're not screwing around. People have a buy-in, again, with, you know, being worked into high fantasy like George R. R. Martin did. Uh, right now we can get away with doing this and everybody will go, oh, okay, we get it. There's, you know, snarks and grumpkins and everything else beyond the wall. So... Uh, it, it works for The Witcher. It works to The Witcher's advantage, actually, I would argue, being that people have been exposed to it. Yeah, I think so. And I think that, that so what I have found, and I'll, I think after this we'll move on to a couple of questions from my patrons, but what I've found uh, is that the Game of Thrones community or the, the people who enjoyed Game of Thrones and were disappointed by season eight, and there are many people who were, um, they have been looking for something else to watch. And right. I think that this has scratched that itch. That is the kind of the feeling that I've got is that people are looking around and they've been thinking, well, yes, there's going to be a Game of Thrones spin-off, but that's going to be a couple of years away. Yes, there's going to be this massive Lord of the Rings thing, but that's a couple of years away. Oh, well, there's a rumor of the Wheel of Time thing. That's happening, but that's certainly not. Yeah, Robert yet. Jordan. There's a big Robert Jordan cult following out there. It, yeah, and that will be big. Um, and uh, I'm considering rereading the books, but that's quite yeah, a mammoth so exercise. Um, but uh, I, th I think for me, this is a thing which has scratched that itch for people who love it. That doesn't mean that it's it's um, it's the same. Um, I th I think. I mean, I'm going to ask you a really. Perhaps it's an unfair question. Is it as good as? early Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings film or anything like that, you think? Is it as good? No. Does it have to be? No. So it's kind of a, a two-fold answer on that one. No, it's not as good. Uh, I obviously had a, a huge, as most of us did, had, had a huge buy-in into Game of Thrones and everything because it was like our generation of, you know, high fantasy. And it was the creme de la creme. Uh, I didn't read... Uh, Witcher until recently I read it before the series came out obviously but uh, you know it's it just it was one of those things that slipped by me in, in youth I, re I remember hearing about it mostly surrounding the video games but certainly not the books uh, but the, the books are great for what they are and the show is good for what it is but it, it doesn't have to be a Game of Thrones production value of Game of Thrones was through the roof uh, or production cost which ultimately leads to 
you know, good for us, uh, was through the roof. You know, they put a lot of money into CGI and everything else. Um, and it was obvious. And I'm really actually wondering, and I don't know if you've seen this just by having to look at, at it, but do you know if the production company is actually a, a Polish or Slavic uh, production company that's uh, running the show? I, have I think no that idea. would make sense to me for some scenes that look like Hercules in the 90s. I, I'd be like, oh, okay, I could buy into that because they're using a studio that's actually in country where they're actually filming. I'm like, oh, okay, I could see that. But I'm not sure if they are or not. Uh, I have to admit, I don't know. And this is the time when I always say there are always more knowledgeable people in the chat. So I'm sure there someone is. will tell us. Somebody, in somebody will know. Um, uh, Sylvia Sabrex, thank you so much. Very kind uh, for the super chat. Uh, saying first take uh, this is about the witcher borrowed a lot from the game of thrones tv series even in stanzas like yet here we are my second take was did george R. R. martin borrow that much from the witcher's books uh they well, were almost the written simultaneously uh they were my I mean my take on the second bit is i don't I mean george R. R. martin does uh, take stuff. This is, I mean, take is probably the wrong word. He takes inspiration from a wide variety of other fantasy uh, writers. Um, we can see that across the. We know that he loves Tolkien, but there's also a huge amount of Lovecraft allusions mm -hmm. that you can get in there. I've talked quite a lot recently about Robin Hobb uh, and the Farseer series that's in there. You can get Memory, Sorrow and Thorn references um, uh, from Tad Williams. Uh, it would not surprise me if he got some inspiration from this too. Did you, have you seen any kind of link across that way? Uh, from uh, the, the a books? link back to it? No, because, because of the time that they were writing the books, but, I mean, Poland, like we were talking about earlier, was very much still coming out of a, a communist regime and, and doing that. Then there wouldn't have been a lot of carryover, uh, especially in the early 90s with that. I mean, Internet is in its infancy at this point. So to think or suggest that they were able to communicate in some way would be highly improbable. And I don't believe they actually know each other. They've met each other, you know, now, but not then. Mm. They certainly had no idea who each other were. Yeah, I mean, so because I he, it's not like he won a Hugo Award. It's not like he was up. I mean, he wasn't moving in that circle because that circle previously didn't exist for Poland, right? So there, there's no way for him to be working inside of that award circle where you have all these premier authors and great stories coming out. I mean, that wasn't really where he was coming from. I mean, he wrote this in a local contest, basically, a local writing contest. Yeah, and he didn't even win. <laughs> but, well, he got third. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but, uh, which I think should give hope to anyone who comes third in these kinds of things, is that, you know... You never know. You never know. Um, but uh, I think that that's a really important point you were saying there about... So George R. R. Martin did come up through the sort of the uh, the, the Anglo fantasy writing world uh, and he was known and recognised and then he started writing A Song of Ice and Fire and that got really big, that won huge amounts of awards as it was going. And then the film, the, the, the show was adapted from that. Um, but people have been kind of like hovering around it for a while. He wasn't sure that it could ever be adapted on all, all the rest of it. Uh, but when we get the Witcher stories, then these, they they came up through a different ecosystem. Uh, there has been a previous um, uh, TV show, actually, incidentally, if you've never come across it, called The Hexa, um, uh, which is a different translation from the Polish that we get The Witcher. Um, uh, but it was really... The um, the video games that which were the thing that provided the spur. So so they they came up through different routes. Um, and so I think that uh, although George R. R. Martin may have got some kind of thoughts and inspiration from there, it's not as obvious as with other writers that I've talked about, like Tolkien and Lovecraft and all the rest of it. Um, but in terms of the TV shows, I think that yes, you're very right that they did take some inspiration when doing the witcher some inspiration for how game of thrones was framed particularly the language i mean did you have any thoughts on this one yourself actually before i sort of go off on well I, I think that they didn't shy away from using the the runic languages the elvish languages because you get them kind of thrown in between and, and parceled out just bit by bit right uh, so I, I think that, you know, Game of Thrones probably helped with that and, and, you know, kept people from 
being super blown away and run away from the TV show by using a language that nobody knows. That's why they have subtitles though. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, I mean, I think that the, uh, for me, the, the biggest problem I had with um, the Witcher, and as I say, I enjoyed this. So these are small nitpicky things is the anachronistic language. Um, I think that uh, they, uh, Geralt is a hard character, I grant, to write to write for because a lot of what goes on is in his head rather than things that he actually says. But I think that the sort of the uh, the you know when when he's swearing and all the rest of it, that is taking inspiration from Game of Thrones. And when we get Yaskia, his whole approach and the language usage he has is actually quite twenty first century. Um, and that, for me, I found a little bit jarring, but I think they took a little bit of that, particularly from the latter Game of Thrones, the idea that you can sprinkle in things that aren't very sort of fantasy high language uh, and and be, um, uh, you know, when he's sort of being self-referential, so look at me all uh, being giving exposition again. It's just that that's very, for me, that was just a little bit too self-referential. Um, uh, but I think that they took inspiration from what happened with Game of Thrones and the idea that you can use um, slightly more modern language in the latter series and people will not find it as anachronistic as I did, for example. Um, so a few people in the chat are pointing out, uh, Dylan Underwood I see, and I think a couple of other people did as well, the Witcher hadn't been translated while George was writing, uh, so yep. I think that probably puts uh, an end to it. Um, uh, I don't think George R. R. Martin has ever really claimed that he's a, a video games fan, particularly. So he may well have been aware of it because he's very aware of. of no, he's a, a he's a board gamer, long time board. Yeah, so I don't, but I don't think that he's. Um, uh, I, I don't. He may well not have actually read it um, uh, when he was doing the writing. Uh, so let's go. Um, uh, we'll come come to some questions from the chat as we come along. But I've got a, couple, a few questions from patrons that I want to get through. Henning J, first of all, hi there, saying um, uh, hi, Robert. Uh, many thanks for including the witch. You're welcome. Uh, by the way, I should probably say um, I, I asked in my video, which I released a few days ago, maybe only a day ago, uh, whether people wanted more <laughs> Witcher videos and the response was pretty overwhelming. So I will do some more Witcher videos. Um, uh, so uh, I think probably starting with something like what is a Witcher and then we'll work our way on from there. Um, anyway, so Henning says, uh, I have a question that may apply to both the Witcher and A Song of Ice and Fire. In The Witcher, several characters repeatedly say lines like, it's magic, it's not real. However, when magic or magical powers are applied in practice, it's very real, like when Yennefer's doing all the fire stuff. So why do characters refer to magic as not being real? Is this a difference between magic that affects the mind or magic that's physical? So, JR, what's your, what's your take? I sent this question to you a, bit, a little bit before we went live. Do, do, well, what's your take on this? I too wondered why they put that in so much. I mean, it was said almost as much as destiny, uh, which did get a bit repetitive even for me. Uh, you know what? The problem I have with it is when she's actually manifesting physical objects and giving them to her in war, and then saying, "Go, oh, it's not real." Like, no, is it? Are they warning you against magic and magic users? Like, it's not real. It's all an illusion. But because there's a there's a difference between magic and an illusion, right? I mean, yes, they're kind of the same thing, but an illusion would kind of infer that, you know, inside of Jennifer's tent or Jennifer, Yennefer's tent, that it would be like it was, right? It was way bigger than it should have been spacious. And, you know, there's a full size bed in there with a mattress and everything inside of her tent on the side of a cliff. But that's like an illusion, right? Because you, your mind sees what it sees. Whereas you're manifesting a physical object, does that magic? Does that make it more magic? Because it's actually now a physical object. It's fletching that you can create an arrow with to launch that arrow into the heart of an enemy. Does that make it any less real at that point? So I hope they clarify it at some point because it does get really messy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think actually I will pick up on this because I've got a 
a slightly different view on this one. Uh, Lauren's Corner. Hi there, Lauren. Uh, for those who don't know, Lauren has got a, a channel herself. If you like um, talking about this kind of stuff and also poetry, uh, do go and check her out. Uh, Lauren says there are also a few things that have been taken from the Witcher games. Um, production companies are Polish, Czech, and English. So there mm -hmm. we go. The, the, it does sound like there was a, an Eastern European uh, influence there. In terms okay, of cool. this, uh, it's magic, uh, it's not real thing. My take is I don't think anyone in the Witcher world disputes that magic is real in the sense that a magician could kill you. Yennefer's use of fire does burn people uh, and on all the rest of it. So I don't think anyone thinks that magic isn't real. I think if you try and take this from Yennefer's perspective, and I know there are other examples of this, but I think this is the easiest one to sort of work our heads around. Uh, she's talking about, is it magic or is it real? She's talking about her feelings. She's talking about the fact that she has felt uh, and theirs is quite a complicated relationship, but she has felt feelings towards Geralt. Um, and she has felt that, hang on a moment, do I only feel this because you made me feel this? Or is this me actually having these feelings towards you? I think that is where we're, we're going with this, is that she felt that Geralt, by using his last wish to bind their fates together, had somehow taken away her free will, had made her in some way have feelings towards him. So those feelings weren't genuinely hers. So my take is that what happened was that when we see her storm off, it's understandable because she's there going, well, is you know, is is this real? Is this, do I actually care about you? Or are you just questioning me? everything because all exactly. of her choices had previously been taken from her, which they exactly. reiterate. And where she goes after that, tellingly, the next thing we see is that she goes back to Istred, her first lover, and sees whether that could be rekindled because that she knew that that was real. That was the feelings she had there were her own feelings. And so I think that that is what they're trying to say here. It's not people questioning whether the effects of magic are real. I think she thinks the effects of magic are real. And that's why she's concerned that that might mean that her feelings aren't. Her feelings have been controlled by Geralt's wish. If that, that's, that's my interpretation of that anyway. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, that um, actually yeah. does. Yeah, it, then I think it's actually a really good um, um, uh, analogy for it. Good. Well, I'm pleased. I agree. We're, we're uh, in the chat saying uh, they don't say what his actual wish was, and he was disagreeing in that conversation as well. She was jumping to conclusions. Uh, this is a really interesting thing. One of the other small bugbears I had about the season uh, was that they changed a few very small details that don't seem like much, but actually are quite important. And one of the small details that they changed was the fact that in the books, she hears what Gerald, uh, Gerald, Geralt uh, wishes for. And she's quite moved by that. Um, whereas here, she kind of figures it out when he says stuff. Um, and that is quite a big difference in my, in my view. Um, so, we don't know, even in the books, we're never told the exact wording. That never comes out. And, and in fact, it's it's a, a thing which has been out there ever since the book has been written. It's never been revealed. No one's ever, you know, the writer's never actually said. Uh, but um, the, the fact that they change that minor detail and a few other minor details as well, that, that's the kind of thing that slightly bothers me because they affect characters, not because I'm nerdily obsessed by getting the details of books right, but because they affect characters. Like another one, I'm off on a rant, JR, sorry. I'll tell Go ahead, no, I'm, I'm about month, to pile then. onto it in a minute. Uh, but the, the, another one that, that slightly annoyed me was um, was actually in, it was the first story in in the, the short stories in um, The Last Wish, the one Which with, uh, 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 yeah, with, uh, um, I've forgotten what it's called now, uh, when he goes to full step, the, the king, and then yes. his daughter had been turned into the whatever Strigger. monster it's called. It's the Strigger. That's the one. Yeah. Um, the and wish. in the books, uh, oh, Geralt it, releases his captive. He knows you know, broadly who's to blame here. 
he releases the captive and gives them a fighting chance to get away. Here, he doesn't. He keeps them tied up. And I think that, for me, again, it sounds like it's a techie detail, but it's actually quite a big difference. In okay, the, so yeah, the, the I, this is a, who Geralt is. I'm with you on this, but I have a problem with the earlier part of the story. So that's after it. they go into this trigger. But this is, and, and this is a, a, a complaint. And this is because, like you said, it affects characters later and, and negatively impacts it. Uh, I really wanted, and if, if I was going to pick one one chapter or out of Last Wish that I absolutely wanted 100%, of course, Last Wish has to be in there, right? Because that's a big part of the story. Yeah. Uh, but I really, really wanted The Witcher because it's a great story. It's one hour. Tell the whole story and tell it true. Uh, I think they did a huge disservice to Falstus and made him look like a blithering idiot, which is not the case at all in the book. He actually slips past his own guards, dressed as a guard, to go see Geralt when he's under guard, been charged by him to have a private conversation with him so that it would be no BS on the table. And it shows how cunning and, and clever of a king that Falstice actually is. But they just make him look like an idiot that was, you know, a, a very, very poorly done Jamie Lannister uh, and it's tragic. It shouldn't be like that because Folstice, you know, he does have stories that come up again in the future. And if you watch the series, you kind of see that again when he and the Northern armies ride down to stop the uh, assault on, on the castle to the North. Uh, but it's a, to me, that's one of those ones that costs going forward. And it, that one they paid the price on, unfortunately, and it, and it was completely unnecessary. Yeah. And that there are a lot of those things that, that, to me, uh, felt unnecessary. There was no real, re and I also noticed that as well. It was the the, the build up was very different, uh, and it led to a very different story. And the characters were very different as well. Um, so I think, it, I overall, I thought this was a pretty good adaptation because it oh, kept yeah. the feel. But there were some details that made me. Uh, not like it so much again in the same story there was a small detail where where Geralt doesn't know how to undo the curse in the books he does uh and it's just like this is actually telling us that he's not as knowledgeable as he was in the books but anyway sorry yeah I and maybe, then we're dumbing down a character that's highly intelligent and, yeah. and intuitive because his life most of the time depends on it and, and the dwindling number of witchers and the, everything else like there's many reasons that witchers aren't in in a plentiful number anymore so just is what it is um yeah uh just picking up on uh leila asmi gushi saying uh, some mentioned that both of them were in in influenced by michael moorcock uh yes i think that's probably right elric if i would highly recommend you read his elric stories um which are uh, excellent and there's a uh, a huge amount of crossover, particularly in George R. R. Martin to uh, the Blood Raven character, the uh, pale white skin, magical sword, and all the rest of it. There's a lot going on there. Um, let's pick up on a question from Anime Lover Nicole from Patreon, saying, hey, guys, I know you both like both series a lot, but which magic system do you like the best? I'll throw this one over to you first. <sighs> Man, uh, I I like Sapowski's <laughs> magic system more just because there's a cost. Not to say that there wasn't cost in Game of Thrones reusing magic, and, and there certainly were, uh, but there wasn't like this where it was so direct. So I kind of like the the idea or the, the balance between the two. If it, it's going to cost you to do this, and here's the cost. Yeah, I think... I think for me, the big thing is that there's a uh, there's a cost in both, uh, and and there's a, that's pretty much across the piece in fantasy fiction. I I found is that magic has a cost. Um, they spelled it out a lot more certainly in uh, in The Witcher. Um, I I found some elements of of The Witcher's. Uh, well, let's take a step back. They tried to explain how magic worked in The Witcher. Uh, which is a thing that George R. R. Martin has deliberately not done in A Song of Ice and Fire. Magic for him is a mysterious thing. People trying to figure out how to do magic. They don't know exactly what's going on. There are people two, two theorizing. Two very distinct writing trope styles, though. That's the, the unveiling and the pulling back of the curtain 
so that you can see what's going on or the leaving of the mystery forward. I mean, that's a very much a choice that one makes when you're writing like that. Exactly. And and this to, to come back to this kind of comparison with Lord of the Rings, actually The Witcher is written in a lot more of that style, is that we can trust what we're told, whereas George R. R. Martin, we may not be able to trust be, trust what we've been told. Um, so, um, but in terms of the magical system, we are told a lot more in The Witcher about how magic works, where it came from, um, and it's a lot more about uh, sort of uh, controlling chaos, as it were. I think there are some troubling elements that I haven't worked through completely yet, but I'm just putting a, a marker out there about the um, uh, with the, the idea that this is about controlling your emotions, and this seems very much a Yennefer tropey women having to control their emotions and wanting babies and all the rest of it. But I'll I'll come back to that another time when I've got slightly more fully formed views. But this is, this is about controlling chaos. George R. R. Martin has not told us where magic comes from. He's not told us whether there is one overarching magical system or lots of different magical systems. That's So they're very, very different. For me, the, I don't think it's a matter of preferring one thing to another. It's about both of them uh, working in their own sphere. The Witcher is a lot smaller world. We have to be honest about George R. R. Martin has created a huge universe. The Witcher is a lot more contained. See, it, it affects that things have later, which seems to be a, a common trope for us tonight. Uh, the, the reason that it works in Martin is because you're coming blind into a world that doesn't know anything about magic anymore. Nobody, there are no snake or snarks and grumpkins and dragons. Are you kidding me? There's none of that there. So they are very much an unknowing society. And then it starts getting pulled back and like, here's the snarks and grumpkins. Here's the dragons. Here's everything else. And oh yeah, here's a shadow baby now. Uh, you know, it, it, it allows for that slow reveal of everything. But conversely in this one, you get to see what it actually costs because it, you have the lesson in your hand between the flower <laughs> and the bolt, right? I mean, that was the whole point of that. You you have to kill a living thing in order to do this. Well, that wouldn't have the same amount of impact that it would uh, in Game of Thrones when all of a sudden there's sorceresses and wizards and witches dying after forming an energy ball to be catapulted at a building. It, it doesn't work that way because of the writing choices that you've made. Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. And uh, Nicola Jurican uh, is asking why Geralt only used one sign in the show. I think that this, I think he used a lot two. of, yeah, I think he did a bit, but it would it was kept quite low key, uh, and there wasn't much explanation of the the potions, and they kept the explanation of uh, sort of the mutations and the, a lot of the lore and history to the Witcher was kept right until almost the very, very end of the season. Wait, do you, do you think we're going to get a big chunk of that in season two? Absolutely. So, so I think what they were very aware of was that they were throwing an entire new lore and world and universe and all the rest of it on people. And they didn't want to, particularly given the fact that they knew that they were going to be trying to do three different timelines at once to have a huge new amount of information being thrown at people that I think they tried deliberately to cut back on what Geralt, uh, what they were telling us about the witches and, and Geralt in particular. So we didn't have really a mention, I think, of Care More Hen um, right until the very end uh, and where he came from. There were a few references, but it was right at the very end that we get this, this mention of, uh, of where he came from, from his mother, from the mutations and all the rest of it. So all of that... I think we're going to get more of in season two once they know that people have bought into this world. I think so too. I can't wait. I can't wait to see the, what I, what I have a feeling is coming next is going to be the, the ride to the Witcher boot camp. I think that's going to be the big chunk of what they do next. And I really hope that the showrunners take a good look at the Aria and Hound scenes throughout Game of Thrones because they do well to look at that and be like, hey, we can redo this in the Witcher form. I would be okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. And and as we're on sort of crossovers between uh, different uh, fandoms, I am absolutely completely behind the let's get Mark Hamill for Vesemir um, uh, idea that would work 
perfectly for me, I have to say. Um, really? Okay. I, it would. I would love it to bits. I mean, unless you can get like a proper actor. Um, I think that... But are you saying Mark Hamill is not a proper actor? I'll let you draw your own conclusions, DR. But you wow. know what I mean. If, if you could if you could get the equivalent of an Alan Rickman, I, I would love it. Somebody who's got gravitas. If anybody's got him laying around... Well, exactly. Uh, but somebody who's got absolute gravitas and, and uh, um, uh, clearly the kind of person who you think has been around for 200 years or more uh, and is this kind of swarthy old soldier who knows everything. Uh, but I love Mark Hamill for me would work perfectly. Um, maybe people disagree. Clearly you do. Um, no, you uh, You just called him a, a, a shoddy actor. I don't think I did, but... Let's move on, in case I did secretly and not realise it. Uh, <laughs> Denise uh, Torgarian, good to see you uh, in the chat. Um, uh, let's get a question uh, from Fred Versteeg. We'll, we'll uh, take a pause in just a moment, but one more question, I think, from my patrons. Fred Versteeg says, do you think The Witcher is more for the hardcore fantasy fans than Game of Thrones, talking about the TV shows? Game of Thrones had politics that felt more realistic than anything happened in The Witcher. The characters in The Witcher felt more like fairy tale characters. Um, so, what what do you what do you think about that? Do you think it's more sort of hardcore fantasy than accessible fantasy that, that Game of Thrones was? Uh, I don't know, but that just gave me a great thought for a new cause to to follow up. But we we should have we shouldn't have fantasy islands, desert islands. Food Island, never mind. It's probably <laughs> totally a U.S. thing that I'm talking about. Anyway, never mind. Um, I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> the question of what is is it more for? Is The Witcher more for hardcore it's fantasy consumable. fans? Consumable. Um, yeah, I think it's consumable for all. Actually, I don't think you have to specifically be a, a well-read, you know, Tolkien, Martin, or whatever fan to understand this world or go into it in just the show, nor in the books. I mean, there's a lot of people that came into the series via the video games. I mean, it's been a huge part of uh, keeping this kind of Witcher phenomenon moving forward. So I, I don't think you do anymore. If you if you play RPGs, you'll get it. If you play, if you read Tolkien, you'll get it. If you haven't read either, but you kind of know Lord of the Rings, you'll be fine. Uh, I think it's actually more palatable for a, a bigger audience than just hardcore fantasy fans. Yeah, I think so. And I think, but I, I think they deliberately dialed some of it back. As I say, I think it's more, um, particularly for season one, if you compare the two season ones, it's more tropey. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I think I said it to you before we went live. It yeah. felt like this was written us um it felt like they knew the writers knew what we would like we we like having uh muscly monster hunters uh, hunters uh, fighting this stupidly that are ostracized creatures. from the rest of the society exactly that we we like having sorcerers in towers we like having strange mystical prophecies and 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 uh, talk of destiny and all the rest of it we love all of that um and it was written, I think, for the fans. It wasn't written for the critics. It was written for the fans. Game of Thrones was written, uh, I wouldn't say it was written for the critics, but it was written in a way that was very, very different. It wasn't written to be immediately accessible. It, it, it deliberately I mean, tried it was transcribed to get... into, into actual lines? I, I, in the first season, yeah, I, I think yeah. so. I think, yeah, I, I think that the first few seasons, they were very much... Don't want to get yes. back in this old argument, but certainly the first few seasons of Game of Thrones, it was a very good adaptation of the books. Um, and and uh, that whatever happened afterwards, I think we have to accept everyone loved it so much because of what happened in the first few seasons. Um, and I think that they are. Correct. Well, I, well, I totally, totally agree with that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, why, why don't we take a, a moment, just as I always do this in the middle of my live streams, uh, just to sort of um, uh, talk about things that are happening on this channel. And then, uh, JR, I'll throw over to you and you can uh, perhaps say some things happening on your channel coming up uh, and, and geek chat one more broadly. Um, the big thing for me on the uh, in terms of what's happening this week is on Wednesday, Wednesday the 15th, is my big relaunch of 
The Well Told Tale. For those who don't know it, it's my uh, my second channel, my passion project. It is my uh, audio narration channel, and it is about me just telling what I consider to be the finest stories ever written in science fiction and fantasy. Um, uh, I love doing it, and uh, on the 15th, I am launching it as a podcast as well. So it's available in two different formats. Um, uh, we've got new, uh, new lots of stuff going on there. So I'm really looking forward to that. I would love you to get involved in that. If you love classic science fiction and fantasy, please do go and check it out. Um, there's, there'll be a link down in the description. Um, in terms of this channel, as I've said, I'm going to be doing some more Witcher content. Um, people seem to want a bit more of that. So I'm going to be doing some more of that. The a Song of Ice and Fire content is going to be carrying on absolutely. Um, I've got a few different things I'm working on. Uh, the Robert's Rebellion series I am going to be bringing to a close. We've only got two or possibly three more videos to go. The next one of them probably in about a week or so's time. Um, but I'm also looking forward to the winds of winter, starting to get into sort of predictions time, trying to work out based on what we know so far, what is likely to be happening next in that story. Uh, and then finally, Lord of the Rings, uh, massive Lord of the Rings fan. And so my uh, my series of sort of explanatory Lord of the Rings Middle Earth videos is going to be carrying on. The next one is going to be about Sauron. Uh, that one's almost ready to roll. Uh, Sauron, a character study. He's not just a two-dimensional baddie. There's a lot more layers to him uh, going on there. And uh, the last thing, because I say it every single time, patrons, thank you. I cannot do what I do without you, particularly this last year. Your support has been literally what has managed to allow me to carry on doing what I do. So thank you. Um, if you uh, at all interested in supporting the channel um, uh, or if you want to get access to some, to some things I do just for my patrons, you'll see uh, patrons get priority questions here on live streams. There's a whole load of other benefits. I do some audio narrations just for my patrons, for example, as well. Uh, please do go and check out the link. There's a link down there uh, to my Patreon page. Um, but JR, uh, what about Geek Chat One? Let, let me know what's going on with that. What can we expect what's, to see? What's going on with Geek Chat One? Well, of course, we still have the chat going on pretty much 24 7 in uh, Facebook land. So you can always check out geeky news and information in there. A lot of us are in there and on there and, and talking in there. I haven't been in much lately, but uh, I'll be getting back to that because I'm going to explain what's been going on. Uh, since Con of Thrones, I've had a lot going on personally, including a bit of a cancer scare and working some other stuff out. So uh, I've had a, a delay in getting back to uh, Geek Chat 1 on YouTube, but it is coming. And so we will start the, the second round of Geek End News on Sundays. We'll be coming up soon. I don't know when. I can't give a number yet. Uh, and the reason for that is I don't want to disappoint anybody else. I think there's plenty of people that are disappointed that it hasn't been on uh, for a while, but none more than myself, of course. Uh, but I also didn't want to come back into it if I couldn't commit to it and make sure that it was consistent is the other thing, because I think the fans always deserve that and they deserve to know what's going on and, and you know, that they have that thing to look forward to every week because I've, you know, it doesn't matter what channel it was at the time or whatever, but, you know, if they had videos that came out on a certain day, I look forward to them uh, just like you guys do. And so I want to make sure that that's there for everybody. And, and that's why. So, that's what's been going on with Geek Chat One and why it's taken a, a, a bit of a step back for a minute, but we're ready. I think we're almost ready to come back in a big way and start making some uh, moves and some changes and uh, try to grow our geeky little fandom all over the place. Well, as I say, you have my endorsement, guys. Uh, I know that the, the videos haven't been coming out on, the, on the, the YouTube channel for Geek Chat One, but the community over on Facebook is still there and very much alive, and I would highly recommend if you like not just Game of Thrones, The Witcher, Mandalorian, but huge amounts of other um, kind of nerdy and exciting things, do head over there. Um, as I say, uh, not just me, but a lot of other um, sort of YouTubers that you will uh, will know and like often uh, pop up in there, like Gemma from Secrets of Citadel, Kyle Azora Hype is often there, uh, Helen uh, Clueless Fangirl is in there a lot as well. So there's a lot of people there if you wish want to sort of mix uh, and, and chat about stuff that we all love. Um, but uh, yeah, on behalf, you're getting a lot of a uh, lot of love in the chat. On behalf of everyone, yeah, we're delighted that you're uh, you're you're uh, 
on the mend and better, and uh, it's uh, definitely it's kind, of, it's kind of it was kind of a rough end to 2019 for a lot of people I know. So hey, hey at least it's 2020, guys. It's over. It's over. We're gonna keep it behind us. Uh, there we go. 2020 new start. I'm being encouraged in the chat. Andrew K saying push the merch. I am terrible at pushing the merch, but I am told, or well, if you if you if you like the idea of having an always indie push geek the mug, merch. Did you, did uh, you guys know that there's an indie geek flamethrower? Right, you should probably go and look and try I to find it. Know. It's a it's a hidden item. You can't. It's not easy to find on the website, but it's there. It's there. You can find you, your. You need to unlock it. You need to buy everything else first. Is that what you're saying? So, it, that's I'm joke. not saying what um, it is. I'm just saying it's there. Uh, I am told, however, that if if you wish to buy an indie geek mug or t-shirt or hoodie or mouse mat or whatever you want uh, at the moment on spreadshirt there is 25 uh, 20 i think it's 20 percent off so now is a good time to do it there is a link down in the description um uh, always uncomfortable talking about merch but there you go that's my merch thing uh thank I'll, I'll you, do it for you robert Pace. just let me know next time you're very, you're very kind. Thank you, everyone. Um, there were a couple of other things I was going to pick up. I got, I, got, I got a question for you, Robert. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so this one's uh, not really out there, but have you noticed a certain theme that's going on with the shows that are coming out right now? Like Witcher and Mando specifically, the the Lone Warrior picking up another pad one. Like it seems to be a no. theme that's running – between multiple channels. Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. I've not really thought about that before, I have to admit. But yeah, so there's definitely those two. I'm trying to work out if there's another one along those lines. That's what I'm trying to think of, if there is another one or not. Uh, you're breaking up for me. I don't know. With you. Oh, sorry. I, oh, I said... Uh, I, I was uh, trying to think if there was another one. Yeah. Uh, I think you're still breaking up, but guys in the chat, let us know if JR is still breaking up. I mean, I can't think of another one off the top of my head. I think that the the the, the big theme, um, and, and come back in uh, in a moment, JR, uh, please do. I think the big thing that I've uh, picked up on is this desire, and this is where the Game of Thrones uh, kind of uh, comparisons come in, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is this desire to adapt fantasy books rather than do completely new fantasy so they've they've uh, they've said okay what else is in there well obviously tolkien will do tolkien what else have we got well there's the witcher there's some books there wheel of time we've talked about as well they're looking they're sniffing around for book fantasy books to adapt rather than try and come up with something completely new i would love there to be something completely new out there i have to say um I'm not seeing Mandalorian. Disney Channel's not out on this side of the Atlantic yet. Well, I think he's in the Netherlands, but just not in the UK. Um, <laughs> but uh, the um, I, that is new, but in an established universe. Um, JR, are you... Uh, no, I think I'm good. Talking game? Oh, everybody, hey, said everybody said I'm fine. It's just your hearing. Oh, was it just my... Oh, well, maybe it's my, uh, my headphone going on. Okay. Um, all right, well, let's. Um, there was one other thing I spotted in the chat just as it was going past. Uh, someone very, uh, I think it was Dylan Underwood, uh, said you should do some Lovecraft on the Well Told Tale. I do do Lovecraft, I've done a Call of Cthulhu, and I, um, although I paused part way through it, um, I did, uh, I've started and I will very soon finish off uh, doing at the Mountains of Madness, which is another fantastic. Did you um, see uh, Lovecraft? Out of curiosity, did I see what, sorry? The lighthouse? No, I did not. You did? Uh, no. Everybody I've talked to that loves Lovecraft said it was amazing, and both William Defoe and Robert Pattinson were uh, phenomenal. Okay, well, I shall. Uh, I shall check I got, it out. I got to check it out too. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll watch it now. Excellent. And another thing that everyone always says whenever I start branching out into other things, the expanse. Um, yes. ev ev everyone I know whose views I value tells me that I would love The Expanse. Uh, I've, I, I have tried it. It didn't quite work for me. Everyone tells me I need to just push on through past the first couple of episodes. But uh, he I hates will it. at some point. I, sorry, what was that? But he hates it. <laughs> I was just doing a golem. Uh, it. Blew my mind, yeah. It blew my mind. <laughs> no, uh, it was really bad. I'm really good at it too. That's why. <laughs> um, 
Uh, Marty uh, Mac or MC saying, will you ever do some Bram Stoker um, Classic, on yeah. the Well Told Tale? Absolutely, yes. I will. I'll be reading uh, Dracula at some point. Uh, Megan V saying, Firefly may be coming back. Um, yes, I heard this rumor. I will believe it when I see it. But I would love it. Um, let's get into um, a couple more questions from my patrons, and then we'll. Uh, uh, dig into oh I'll just say Preon Krutz saying haven't watched Netflix Dracula yet uh, any good we talked about this a little bit earlier so if you if you go skip back a little bit later you will be able to get it uh, my review is I've watched the first one and a half episodes loved it people in the chat watched the second one and a half episodes didn't love it uh, that's the, the the short version uh, but Fedra the beloved says hello to the both of you bit of a subjective question but what did you think of the casting in The Witcher, especially that of Geralt. Um, what, what do you reckon? Did did you like the casting? I don't love the casting. I, I think I think it was it was great, especially since he fought for it. That he walked away from Superman for this. Uh, so I think I think Cavill being Geralt, I'm good with. I'll never say a bad thing about it. Uh, You'll never say a bad word about it. Okay, well, I mean, I think, I think, I think he did a very good job. I think it's actually Geralt is a very hard character to act. I would have to say, um, I was a little bit snarky about this probably in a previous live stream, saying, you know, how hard can it be? Geralt is pretty monosyllabic and doesn't have many emotions, um, but he does have some emotions. Yeah, but he does have emotions. But you, ha he has to not be showing them most of the time. And I think that Henry Cavill did do a good job with it, I have to say, all in all. I particularly, I did really like Siri. Uh, I can't remember the actress's name who was Siri. I thought she did a fantastic she job. She reminds me of a young Kristen, Kirsten Dunst. Yeah, I can see where you can see that. I thought that that, I think that worked really well. I think a lot of the supporting actors uh, as well. I, More I, spot I, on. I thought it was great. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, so, um, yeah, overall, I... I mean, I don't, I can't say I was blown away by anything. I can't say that there was anything like when I watched Game of Thrones season one, the character of Tyrion, I thought, wow, you've nailed this. Um, uh, Peter Dinklage, fantastic job. I can't say that there's anyone in The Witcher that I absolutely adored and thought, wow, that is this character incarnate. Um, but I think overall, everyone did a good job and I think that they can build on that uh, going forward. And to be fair, Tyrion had a lot of better lines than Geralt. Geralt, yeah. If you ask anyone to do who it, Geralt, who would, what was the worst cast? Worst casting for the main. I mean, I don't usually one, like sorry? doing worst casting for kind of main characters, but well, main and outside outlier characters that are repetitive. Yeah, the, I mean, the one, the one, the one that I couldn't just get by. I loved who they cast. I just hated the wardrobe. Was Mousick. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you're a druid, not a, a you know, a parlor dancer. Why are you dressed like a jester in a court that's not even yours? I mean, I didn't mind him. I, th I have to say it's not. Uh, I wanted more of a druidy druid look. You know what I mean? Like he's from yeah. an island race. He should be ironborn. So I wanted like somewhat of an ironborn look to him. Yeah, I get that. I get that. I mean, I don't. I, it wasn't a thing. I got that bothered. I, I quite liked the, the the character, and I actually that kind of made me not worry too much about. Great actor. Um, yeah, I thought he, he did a good job with the brief he was given, and I was quite happy with it. So I, it didn't bother me too much. I don't think there was anyone that really jarred. I have to say. Um, uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to, there are a few characters like, say, Triss, who I assume is going to have more of a role later on, um, who I'd have liked to see a bit more of so I could actually get a view on. Um, uh, but no, there was nobody really jarred uh, there, I have to say. No, oh, interesting. Um, Melissa L. Gill, thank you so much for the Super Chat, saying, have you read any of the Second Law series from Joe Abercrombie? Um, yes, this was, again, this was a long time ago. I find I say this quite a lot with fantasy stories. I, I have a long time ago. So that, um, uh, that I think, that's the, the Blade itself uh, series, um, and I did enjoy it. Um, and that is one of those... Uh, 
this comes up every now and then. People say, are they making something that... It's one of those um, fantasy series that everybody likes, and this was the case with things like A Song of Ice and Fire, and it kind of gets bandied around lots, and the rights get sold off to somebody, and then they never make it, and then they come back and they sell them off to somebody else, and they never make it. So um, it's, it seems to be always nearly about to happen but not actually um so uh yeah i would think it would it would work very well for uh tv i i think i i mean i'm, I'm sure robert jordan fans will be aghast at this i would personally have preferred that to be adapted um or possibly or definitely robin hobbs farseer series um than uh than robert jordan's wheel of time um i have to say uh, which i find um uh, how does one say this it, it, it slowed down the further into the series you got as you read those books um and i think that other series kept the pace up and i think that would work better for tv i'm sure they can they can get around that and adapt in, in, in an adaptation uh but i think that there's there are more hurdles to get over with that i mean have you have you read any joe abercrombie no i have not actually not what i'm okay. familiar with uh, Rick Hoppy's talking about the expanse, saying I have to hang in for the first four or five episodes. This is what people say. Rick when Hoppy I get past, is right. Uh, yeah, when I get past all of the uh, uh, the other things, I have to finish Dracula. Or as I say, love Doctor Who. Always have to watch Doctor Who. I've got that to work my way through. I've got the Mandalorian. I've got a lot of things on my plate at the moment, guys. Don't rush me. Uh, <laughs> I, I will. I will get to the expanse again. I promise you. Um, uh, agree we're, we're saying you can see that Geralt has emotions and is holding back that is not easy yeah absolutely I agree there um, uh, I did have some reservations about Henry Cavill beforehand and was a little bit snarky about that I do now completely take them back uh, unreservedly uh, take them back I think that he did a very good job with this uh, Captain uh, Anopheles uh, thank you so much for the super chat saying if you like cosmic horror I'd love you to read some stories from the SCP website uh, I'd love to hear you talk about the Fifth Church and other anomalies. I, uh, I have to admit this is something which is outside of my knowledge and experience, but I will check it out. Um, is there anything, uh, JR, is this, uh, is this ringing any bells with you? No, this is uh, outside of my scope too. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, anomalies, SCP. But, uh, by all means, uh, if you're on Twitter, guys, by the way, I'm I'm on Twitter and uh, I'm on there a reasonable amount. Uh, please do follow me if you look for uh, In Deep Geek over there. I'm also on other bits of social media. But if you tweet at me with a link to it, I will very happily go over and, ha and have a look uh, and see what I can find out for that. So thank you very much. wish I could talk about it a bit more, uh, but that's something I'm not particularly uh, aware of at the moment. Uh, Andrew Kay talking about the first few books, The Wheel of Time. Yeah, I'm the same. I did read them and, and slowly... Um, a 14,000 page books is hard to keep the momentum up for that long. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, Jordan B saying, didn't like The Expanse. Fair enough. Um, so, uh, da, 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 yeah. So basically, what, what is it with The Expanse that hangs you up, Robert? Uh, yeah. But the TV series, not the books, obviously. I've not read the books. So I read the TV. No, I've read the TV. I, I watched the first two episodes um mm -hmm. uh, and i enjoyed it and um i mean i wish i could put my finger on it exactly but i'm one of those people that i if i don't rush back to watch it then i obviously wasn't grabbed by it and i think uh, i tried it actually i tried it twice i watched the first couple of episodes and then i went back and tried to watch the first episode again That's both I times I, I haven't immediately rushed on to try and oh let's watch the next one now um, so maybe it's something to do with the pace. Maybe it's something to do with that there wasn't a plot hook in those first episodes. So what Rick Hoppy was saying there, everyone has told me, is that it, you do have to watch the first four or five, and then you start really getting into it. So um, uh, I, I suspect, given the vast amount of people uh, who I respect who like this, uh, I suspect it's more of a problem with me than the actual show itself. Um, uh, so maybe I just need to try it again with an open mind and push on through. Do you, I, do you I, I highly recommend that? it. Do you want to give me the, the short version of why I should do it, JR? I would love that. The the short version of why you should do it? Yeah. Uh, because Belt of Loda got a, got a fight for a belt, Belt of Loda. Everybody. 
Okay, that meant nothing to me, guys. I hope that that meant something to you. <laughs> I got a what a who? Because you got to keep the rain off your head. Okay, awesome. Uh, I'll uh, I'm just going to keep one. coming up with random quotes from the show and, and throwing them at you okay. until you're like, what is he talking about? I, that was my uh, whole goal anyway. I thought it might work. It, it, it's baffled me into wanting to watch it. So let's go with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Pia, Pia Herber, thank you so much. Uh, another question from one of my patrons um, talking about the music. I think this is something you were wanting to talk about, uh, saying, I personally would like to see Apocalyptica or Sonna Jobarte performing in the Witcher series. Which musical singer do you prefer? Uh, now, I'm, I'm aware of Apocalyptica, who do sort of... Um, orchestral metal i think is probably the best way of saying it uh big fan i, I could see how that could work i'm not as au fait with uh sona joe Bate, which is probably why i'm probably mispronouncing it um uh but uh jr do you want to talk about the uh, the music for this <sighs> do i want to talk about <laughs> not really i don't know that you could call it music i think it'd be an insult oh Oh, yeah, I know. It, it, the problem that I have with most of the music, and, it, and I'm not the only one that has said this, too. A couple other people have talked to me and told me, they're like, I absolutely love it, but the music just pulls me right out of it. I'm like, I totally understand. Uh, it, it's just a bit jarring. Uh, if you're going to use period music, then use period music. And if you're going to do it in that style, then do it in that style. But don't add electric guitars and, and a bass amplifier to it. Like, it just doesn't work. Uh, and that's what they mean by like, it's just really jarring. It just takes you out of it. And some of it's done really well. Don't get me wrong. It's not to say that it's all of it, but man, the ones that pull you out, they pull you way out. If they had that music in the expanse, Robert would never watch it. <laughs> um, okay. Well, look, I think uh, so, so the music, <clears throat> I, th I think I get where you're coming from on this in the, uh, I didn't, when I was watching it through the first time, it didn't jar with me. But the more I think about it, when I sort of watched back bits of it, when I was preparing my video, I, I watched episodes back and all the rest of it. Um, it it's what I was saying about the dialogue. Um, as I say, these, for me, these are quite small matters. I enjoyed it. But the dialogue sometimes came across as anachronistic. People would use phrases that were... 21st century um, Western phrases, and it was just felt wrong in that context. Um, uh, and uh, they, that, I think, also seemed the way with the music, was that it was like, as you say, you, if you have an electric guitar, that is that what you want for this? I mean, I don't know. It just didn't always quite fit right. I think the problem that we've had had is that we've been spoiled by Raman Jalili in both yes. Game of Thrones and in Westworld, who does astonishingly oh. just right music. Um, and so I think that I don't like to compare the two, but he is just like so much uh, above so many other people. I'll go ahead and say it right now. He's, the... he's this generation's John Williams. I think you're probably right on that one, as I say, and I'm, I cannot wait. One of the reasons I can't wait for, for season three of Westworld, I cannot wait to see what he does with it because it's um, his work for me, his work on Westworld as a, as a standard was even higher than he did for, for Game of Thrones. There were some outstanding things he did for Game of Thrones, but as, as, a, as a standard, what he did over on uh, Westworld was so amazing. So I cannot wait to see what he's doing there. Um, uh, but yeah, so I think that there's an element of it. it's just not quite as high and brilliant as we're expecting. It's still pretty good. Uh, but there was, for me, there was this slightly anachronistic feel sometimes about it. But I'm going to uh, I'm gonna go there. I would decided I <laughs> thought I wasn't going to do this. Um, <laughs> what, what, what do we think about Toss a Coin to Your Witcher as a song? Um, uh, you 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 side a lot about the music as a whole. This is the thing which has come out as being very meme worthy. Everyone says it's very catchy. What what's your take, Jr? Are you on the bandwagon? Sure, if people want it, let them have it. <laughs> I was asking, <laughs> I, I, not whether you will allow other people to be on the bandwagon. I was asking if you were on the bandwagon. Uh, no, no, not, not at all. <laughs> I think it's I think it's dribble. 
Uh, I'm with Dylan Underwood saying Tussle Coin is too poppy and modern for me. I think this again is a bit anachronistic for me. I think that the mu the, the musical style felt like. Well, maybe you should uh, be write a blog for a Witcher, and then everybody would understand it. <laughs> yeah, something along those lines. It's um, uh, yes, it's catchy. Yes, it was good, but it didn't quite fit for me. Uh, I think that the. The spirit of the song, uh, I talk about this in my video, actually, uh, the spirit of the song, the idea, it captures exactly what that character is attempting to do. And I think that the lyrics, therefore, worked quite well. But in terms of the delivery and the, the musicality of it, um, it didn't quite work for me. It, it, uh, didn't, it didn't work for me either, but I understand the form and the function of it. And a lot of people don't understand that bards were not just singers, but they were the purveyors of news. As they went from town to town and castle to castle, they would bring the news of that previous castle to the next one. This is how news spread uh, among the common people. So, I mean, there's a big place in the world for bards. Uh, this one, though, I, that song just oh, it drives me nuts. Yeah, I wouldn't go as far as to say it drives me nuts, uh, but I would say that I found it... Uh, Anachronistic. That's my word of the day, guys. It, it, it uh, really has been great. anachronistic. It has <laughs> been your word. Um, uh, let's. I, I think we're going to start moving on to a couple of other things now. But if there's any more questions, guys, you've got about or thoughts or comments um, about uh, the Witcher, part. that's what I've just decided. That Robert will watch it. Uh, I will watch it. What? Sorry. If, if we have a space bard, then you'll watch it. I. I mean, it would work for me. It See, would you're okay, trying, you're so trying to tell it. me the expanse just, doesn't have a space bar. We got to find a space bar to get on the expanse, and we'll be okay. fine. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's solve. go with that then. Excellent, um, uh, guys. If you've got any more questions about the witch, and now is a good time to drop them into the the chat. We'll try and pick up as many of them as we po uh, possibly can as we go through. I've got a couple more questions, not specifically related to the Witcher. Um, one uh, about. A song of ice and fire actually from no scar um uh, one of my patrons saying uh did howland reed fight in robert's rebellion i know howland accompanied ned to the tower of joy but did he fight under the stark banner in any of the battles um the the short answer on this one is uh, we don't have any detailed information uh george r martin didn't specify i i have at the back of my head that i read somewhere one of the so Spake Martin, which, and if you've never come across So Spake Martin and you're as nerdy as me, it's amazing. It's basically people have collected all the public utterances of George R.R. Martin about A Song of Ice and Fire and just collected them in one place. Uh, and so you just find him coming out with random comments about different characters and all the rest of it. Um, I have in the back of my mind that I read somewhere on there that he was with Ned during the war. Um, uh, so I think that that is what uh, the, the truth of it was. And that still leaves him a huge chunk of time, incidentally, when we don't know where he was, because he wasn't with Ned at the very beginning over uh, over in the Erie, when Ned went all the way up to the north and then all the way back down again. Um, but that, so that still leaves him months when we, he's unaccountable uh, uh, or unaccounted for. Um, but our best understanding is that he was certainly with Ned at uh, the Battle of Storm's End or the, the lifting of the siege. They didn't actually have a battle, but the lifting of the siege at Storm's End. And the clear implication is that he was there for the two battles, uh, Stony Stepped and uh, the Ruby Ford, uh, that, uh, that Ned was involved in, uh, as well as then the, um, uh, the entry into King's Landing, which was not really a battle by the time they got there uh the stark army got there so that's that's what we've the information that we have on that um uh jr have you got anything to add to that or any speculation I, on how I, 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 I started shaking my head immediately and i went oh wait no he was and yes he he was referred to being at different battle places with ned and then uh, of course the end of the, uh, the tower of joy was that actually the question though did he fight with Ned during Robert's Rebellion? He did. Yes, that was the question. And yes. What? What? But it's not really talked about what he did or with whom. But that was it. Yeah. So it's not in the it's not in the books themselves. No, it's not in main text. Uh, it's this is in the um, 
the additional stuff that George R. R. Martin said around the outside, just in answers to questions and the like. So, uh, so that's where we're at on that one. Um, let's uh, have a quick flick through. Does anybody um, else just want a whole book of how and read? Like, I really, <laughs> really would love that book. Well, I'm uh, I'm doing is not a book, but I will be doing the probably the final video in my Robert's Rebellion series is. And I haven't got a catchy name for it yet, but it's um, the If in Doubt, Blame, um, uh, Blood Raven and Howland. Uh, how Blood Raven and Howland basically organized the whole thing and pulled the strings all the way through. It was their fault. Uh, it, everything was their fault. And also they're the saviors in, from their perspective. Um, uh, but that is going to be the last video I do in the Roberts Rebellion series. It's probably going to be an epic length video um, and it's going to... Uh, I show my perspective on how they're involved all the way through from the tourney at Harren Hall right the way through to the Tower of Joy um, and I think even a bit earlier than that as well but that's uh, that's by the by um, the um, I've got one more question from my patrons um, uh, I'll get to this one JR if you want to um, have a flick through the chat, see if there's any good questions there yep, that we we'll pick up after that. Um, guys, I think we'll probably go for about another 10 minutes. As I say, this is probably a good time, as I say, if you've got any final questions, to be dropping them into the chat. Uh, John C. Nags uh, over on Patreon says, I tried the first episode of The Witcher, but it didn't catch me right away. I'm going to hold off listening live today, so hopefully this, you're catching this a lot later um, uh, and going to give it another try. Um, I also wanted to ask if you've ever read the Dune series by Frank Herbert. I know you've had Quinn from Ideas of Ice and Fire on. Yeah. Uh, it seems like it'd be right up your alley. So um, in terms of Dune, uh, yes, I have. Uh, for those who uh, have never read it, so you get the, the novel Dune uh, by Frank Herbert, and then there's a whole series of uh, sort of follow-on novels after that. Um, so I've read that uh, two or three times, actually. Um, and... The follow-on series, I've read the first two or three books after that, God Emperor of Dune and a couple of others, I think. And I enjoyed them. Dune itself is a fantastic story. If you've never read it, I would highly recommend. It's one of those things where they keep on making, there was a miniseries, there was a film, oh, I don't know, 30 years ago, maybe, with a whole load of random people like Sting in it. Um, and uh, it was really I, awful. <laughs> yeah, I think it had Patrick Stewart in a sort of an early role as well. Um, uh, but uh, it's I think the kind Charles of thing Dance might have been in it too. He may well have done. Uh, Carl McLachlan, I think, was in it. But anyway, it was a. Uh, um, it was one of those. They've never truly got it right, June. It's this massive epic. It's. It's. I mean, you could call it sort of the equivalent of the the, the Lord of the Rings in science fiction form in its scope. Um, it really is a work of art. And there are, I think, a couple of films coming out uh, either later this year or next year. Uh, they're currently uh, making them, so uh, uh, fingers crossed that one will work out finally. Um, for those who don't know Quinn from Ideas of Ice and Fire, a fantastic channel. Um, I'd highly recommend it. if you're into June, you do go and check him out. He does uh, A Song of Ice and Fire as well as June um, uh, over there. So please do go and check that out. He's been on this channel a couple of times. I've been over on his channel as well. So um, uh, definitely a friend of the channel. Um, uh, whether I will cover it as a book, uh, I'm not covering books specifically like that just at the moment. Um, uh, I think if they ever do... A, TV show, then I would certainly consider it. But um, uh, that's where I'm at on it. I, if you've never engaged with June, it's something I would definitely recommend. Uh, but JR, did, did you spot anything in the chat that we can? Um, oh, we got uh, a couple in there. Uh, sure. Lauren's Corner. Hey, Lauren. Do you think we have seen the last of creepy DCU Superman now that Henry has done well as Geralt? Uh. I, mean, I think he. I think he was done with Superman before he even became Geralt. Yeah, and 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 as we're being a little bit snarky on this one, I don't. I, I'm not a Superman fan, so I don't really care that much. Um, I'm uh, not a big I, Superman fan either. For me, he is the dullest of the superheroes, um, uh, so it doesn't really bother me. Um, uh, I if they did something new and original with Superman as a character, then 
yeah, great, I'd love it. But um, I don't think Henry Cavill's going back. I think he's got his new franchise now. I think he, he's, he knows where he's going to go with it. I don't think we're going to see him back uh, being uh, in the standex any day soon. Uh, I got a question that's meant for you, but I'll oh. go ahead and answer it. Oh, great. You'll love it. <laughs> Does the Expanse have a Taco Bell? The answer is no, and how would Robert know that? <laughs> The expanse does not. This doesn't come from Gina, does it? By any chance? What? Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I thought I'd field that one for you. Well, that's that's very kind. As far as I'm aware, it does not. Um, uh, and uh, most parts of the United Kingdom do not either. Um, uh, that's an in joke. So apologies to everybody else who's watching this and has absolutely no idea what's going on uh, on with that. Um, but Jordan uh, B has a real question. Uh, go for it. Jordan B would like to know, will you do anything with his dark material? Um, yes, is the short answer. So for those who don't know, it was on uh, BBC in this country and I think HBO uh, over in America. Um, his Dark Materials, so His Dark Materials Season 1, which was an adaptation of Book 1 from, uh, from that series by Philip Pullman, which is uh, a fantastic children's story but it's it's so much more than a children's story um uh, it was brilliant I, I watched the series uh, just before christmas uh and it was uh, the the adaptation that, that the book deserved i loved it to bits the the character of lyra it was the same um uh and i can't remember the character name but if you remember watching the film logan the sort of the, the last one when they did uh, when sort of uh, Hugh Jackman was was signing off as, as sort of an old weary Wolverine, uh, the girl in that is is Lyra in this, and she was amazing there, and she's amazing in this as well. And it's got such a fantastic cast. Ruth Wilson is brilliant in it. Highly, highly recommend it if you like the books. If you don't like the books, I still recommend it. In terms of covering it, um, I'm I think I've missed the boat for season one. Uh, but they are definitely making season two. I assume it'll be around the same time next year, so sort of uh, late uh, late 2020, late this year. I will be covering it. I haven't worked out exactly how yet. Maybe I'll do uh, breakdowns for each episode or maybe I'll do a season overview or something. I don't know, but I will definitely, because I really enjoyed it, love the books, I will definitely be covering it, yeah. Do you, do you know the stories, uh, JR? I, I know a little bit about them, but most of it's been from studying, not from actually reading source material. So there is that. Yeah, there was a, a, a film, um, a, a movie a few years ago, a couple of people are mentioning it in the chat, uh, that was not, that didn't really do justice to the books, it has to be said. Um, and I think everybody recognized it who was involved in it. It was glossy and fine, but didn't have the heart and soul. Um, Makes sense. Uh, this, uh, this, we, one, this one's for you. I haven't well, seen Westworld. Did you know that that was possible, Robert? What it platform is it on? <laughs> this is uh, uh, Shaman Khan, Angel Heart. Well, let me let me give you the hard sell on Westworld. Um, um, Westworld is on HBO. It's going to be coming out. They've done two seasons already. It is, uh, for my money, uh, I was going to say the finest probably one of the finest certainly uh tv shows out there at the moment in terms of production acting plotting everything it's absolutely brilliant it's uh when it's at its best it is mind-blowingly good um uh season three is coming soon we don't know exactly when certainly in the next two or three months i would have thought my best bet is it's going to actually be in April in the old slot they always used to bring out Game of Thrones on the Sunday night. Um, so I would highly recommend it. It's got some fantastic acting in. Uh, people like Tandy Newton, people like Anthony Hopkins are there as long as well as a huge raft of other incredibly talented actors. Um, and uh, the yeah, writer Harris. is hot on. Tons, tons of people with that. It's just oh, yeah, Ed Harris, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's so many fantastic actors are in, involved in this. And the the what they've done as a show is that they've committed, uh, it's Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy who do it, that, and, and they have committed to doing one every two years. 
because they didn't want to be on the treadmill of doing one every year. They wanted to do one every two years and have the time to actually properly write each season uh, and develop it without having time pressures put upon them, which I love. This is uh, this is the kind of commitment to excellence that I appreciate. Uh, Megan V. Hello, Megan. Uh, thank you for your super chat. Just saying, Robert, please say aluminium tackle so there you go uh megan that's a, a treat for you um is there anything else before we sign off jay is there anything else that you think we should be picking up from in the chat oh i'm sure i've missed plenty but what can i say i'm a little rusty at getting back into this but uh no i scrolled all the way up and didn't see uh, a whole lot fantastic okay well what i'll do is well let's let's uh, draw this one to a close um uh jr do you want to let everybody know uh or remind everyone where they can find you on the internet uh, you can pretty much find me at anything that says Geek Chat One in it. Geekchat1.com, Geek Chat One on YouTube, Geek Chat One on Facebook, Geek Chat One on it, everywhere. We're, we're just going to take over everything saying Geek Chat One. That's our entire plan. Well, it's working, and uh, as <laughs> I, I would I would highly recommend that you do go and check out Geek Chat One wherever you can find it. Um, uh, guys, thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, great questions in the chat. Uh, JR, it's an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, Thank you, I'm having make Robert. You Always disappear awesome. Disappear for one moment, uh, just so that I can do my uh, wiggly things. If you're watching this a little bit later um, uh, and you are wanting to watch more of these live streams uh, in a few seconds coming here-ish, there will be a link to those other live streams. And coming here-ish, there will be a link to my Patreon page if you're interested in either supporting the channel or, uh, or getting access to some of the stuff that I do just for my patrons. Uh, but JR, thank you again. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Um, uh, guys in the chat, uh, particularly for the Super Chats, uh, thank you so much. I will be back here next week uh, with another guest, hopefully. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure yet what we're going to talk about, but I will be putting it up on Twitter. So take care, uh, everyone. Nor, nor with which guest it'll be. Oh, indeed. Who, who knows? It's a mystery, even to me. Uh, this is how disorganized I am this year, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, guys, take care, and I will see you again soon.